Today's guest on Brief Conversations about Intergroup Relations is Derek Brown. Derek is a doctoral candidate at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. So Derek, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, I should note that this is the first one I've recorded in two years. So my students who can see that my background has changed uh, shouldn't be too alarmed. And they should be struck by the fact that no other changes to my physical appearance have occurred in the last two years. Uh, so we just won't mention that at all. But Derek is here to tell us a little bit about his research about how advantage group members think about shifts in the way that groups are treated in relative group standing. Um, so if you could just, I'd like to start these out more broadly though, if you could just tell me, you know, what are the research questions that really guide your work? Yeah, um, one of the broad research questions that guides my work is this question about what's preventing us from creating a more equal or equitable society? What are the psychological barriers that prevent us from achieving this goal that it seems like a lot of people want or are motivated to pursue? Um, and in this paper in particular, that's something that we're trying to explore. Yeah, so could you tell us like a little bit about the history of this idea? You know, did it come from a combination of you know, deep research in the literature, but also just kind of recognizing how things really are out in the real world that really motivated it? Yeah, a little bit of both. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So what was the genesis of the idea? Yeah, both. It was uh, just in grad school trying to find um, a research idea with my advisor. And uh, I, I love going into the literature and figuring out um, kind of in the future research sections, what questions are still there, what questions are still pressing. And so it was a little bit of that, but a lot also about what my advisor and I saw and I saw um, kind of happening again and again in these articles and reports about the tech industry, that there, these tech firms were funneling a lot of money towards diversity initiatives, but in around, what is that, 2018, 2019, a lot of reports are saying, where is the progress? Why are we only seeing incremental progress? And this was around the time James Damore the, wrote his Google manifesto, and there was a lot of this, um, what some call backlash towards diversity initiatives, typically from people in the advantage group or from the majority group saying that diversity actually is harming us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were trying to understand this um, in these reports and in these like man that manifesto, for example, there was always a statement, I, I'm not racist, I'm egalitarian, but these things are harming people in my group. And so we wanted to try to figure out a way that we could kind of um, situate some research questions to explore this. And actually in the first package of studies, it's kind of more focused on diversity initiatives and this paper that came out this year is kind of a broader perspective of that to show that it's not just about people, employees' reactions to diversity and inclusion initiatives, it's something more broad um, and how we perceive equality in general. Right, okay, so that, that's well put. I like how that was informed by, you know, a read of the literature, but also how these things can be sparked through just paying attention to how people are talking about these things in the real world. So yeah. we social psychologists are lucky in that we can use that as insight and then run yeah. the very impressive, tightly controlled laboratory studies that you did to follow it up. So it was a nine study paper. We're not going to get all nine studies, but I, I think the first few studies do a nice job of, you know, using real world social groups, you know, to um, groups of different races, for example, avoid the way, ways of highlighting that people think about this. But then you also did the, you know, empirical thing of saying, well, if we even in context where we strip out that kind of existing social context, we can still see these types of effects. So one study in particular that I was really found interesting was study number seven, which we'll go over in class a little bit. But you, uh, in a nod also to the social psychology literature, assigned people to eagles versus rattlers. Yeah. And you had them evaluate, you know, which type of benefit, which type of um, benefit is, is more appealing to you. You were in a group, participants were in a group where they were in the more adva uh, advantage group where they had more resources, they had more bonus tokens, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And then the other group had much less and they had to evaluate, you know, which one do you prefer? That you had a win-win condition where your group moves up a little bit in terms of their resources and the other group moves up a lot more or mm -hmm. a lose-lose where, you know, both, to, both go down. And despite the fact that, you know, your group is objectively getting more, people found this idea of a, of a relative shift between the two groups in this win-win condition less appealing. I thought it was less advantageous to them. Is that a fair way of kind of summarizing 
There yeah, it, it's a really good way to summarize it. I love the the hand gestures. If my advisor ever sees it, he'll he'll say, "See, it's useful," because I always make fun of him in Zoom okay, meetings. Awesome. <laughs> so, do you think it's you know, do you think it's fair to say that one takeaway from your paper is that when people think about their group or their group standing, they're much more tuned into the relative position of their group than they are the absolute position of their group. Yes, uh, that that would be a fair. Um, uh, kind of takeaway to to grab to grab on on from this paper. Sorry, um, it seems like people in the advantage group are ignoring kind of what equality is trying to do um, when they see these changes actually um, occurring, and it seems like they want to somehow protect this uh, what is perceived even in these arbitrary set, uh, group settings as a prize or a valued resource. These bonuses that are attached to money um, as something that they want to preserve for their end group. Okay, yeah, I think that that's a nice way of putting it. Um, but kind of jumping off of that, one thing that I thought was interesting about this research is that you also include a bunch of individual difference measures. We're probably gonna talk about them a little bit later in this class, but we can touch on them a little bit now. And those individual difference measures, you know, were pretty straightforward. There was something like explicit attitudes for the studies that you dealt in terms of, you know, interracial context, how much do you like this racial outgroup is something you asked people. Mm -hmm. Some uh, broader ones like social dominance orientation, how much are you drawn to hierarchy? Mm -hmm. it didn't really seem like across studies that these self-reported attitudes or beliefs were all that strong of predictors of how much you thought that you were being disadvantaged from these even win-win proposals. So why do you think it was the case that these individual difference measures didn't really show up as predictive in your own studies? That's a question that I'm still trying to understand. Um, the current literature would suggest that these pe people who were the most ideologically opposed would be the ones that would express, and I'll just call this zero sum mindset, that if for these gains to be made, I need to incur a loss. And we do find that they're correlated with these ideological beliefs like political conservatism, social dominance orientation, explicit prejudice. But there, it's not enough to like reasonably or consistently predict um, a difference between people who were more ideologically opposed and people who uh, self-avow um, to be more egalitarian, more supportive of these policies. We think that part of it is because of group membership. There's something that, oh, if my group has this advantage, something kicks in and um, some, like I want to protect that advantage. It also affects people's mental representation of what equality might even entail and how equality should be achieved. We might be violating things like that. And then there are also, um, there's also some discussion in the literature that uh, is by Christina Starmans that people might be fine with inequality as long as they perceive it as a fair system or a meritocratic system. And so this these policies might also be violating or kind of battling with these beliefs that people might hold that also might work in concert with these ideological beliefs that we've measured. So there are a lot of things that um, we're currently trying to explore to understand why it is um, that people still see these as harm and it's working kind of even if it's in concert or um, orthogonally to these ideological beliefs, but it's a question that I can't really, I don't really know the, the strong answer to. Fair enough. I mean, it's still, uh, I think it's very interesting when you don't see these effects that you're so strongly anticipating and it can generate yeah. explanations. Yeah. As the more implicitly focused researcher, I like this idea that you know, there's something automatic that kicks in when your own group is involved in these. Yeah. And so it's kind of like a real reflexive defensive response that might mm -hmm. not be all that well aligned with, you know, your more thoughtful or abstract goals. So that's the interpretation I would tend to, but I'm obviously biased about that. And we'll just have to leave it up to you in the years to come to, to solve this issue. Uh, I also wanted to touch on, I think it was study nine, forgive me if it was study eight, but this was the manipulation where is that, well, one way that maybe we can get people to be more considerate is instead of presenting these policies separately, a win-win or a lose-lose condition, mm -hmm. you present them jointly. Here's a win-win and a lose-lose. I'm back to my hands again. Uh, you mm -hmm. present them jointly. And you found that, you know, maybe it helped a little bit, but it wasn't, didn't mm -hmm. really cut down on this bias in the way that people evaluate the plans. Is that kind of a fair way of summarizing your results? Yeah, if people are focusing in on this relative difference or the relative changes, then okay, let's present two joint options so they can also make a relative comparison of two equality policies, one in which they benefit, one in which they, they don't. Um, and this joint versus separate evaluation has also been used in um, negotiations literature and also the judgment and decision-making literature to kind of um, 
nudge people to make more informed policy decisions. And so, okay, this is a very policy oriented kind of idea. Let's see if it will work. And we found that it did in a way work as it intended. It did change people's voting. People supported the, the joint, um, the equality policy more in the joint versus the separate commission, but it didn't um, move around this misperception that the policy would harm them which we found is also strongly predictive of voting behavior um, and perceptions of fairness and things like that. And so while it kind of worked as in its intended form, it didn't work for the purposes um, as we'd hoped for um, kind of moving around this misperception that equality would harm the advantaged group. Right, so I think it's a, as you said, a very sensible, reasonable approach to say, we have all this evidence that this joint versus separate manipulation works in all these other contexts and it worked some, but maybe not as much as you anticipated here. So my follow up that you can probably anticipate is, you know, do you have any other ideas on the back burner right now for other approaches that you might think of as interventions that can cut down on this type of biased evaluation of these policies? Yeah, um, we've been brainstorming ways uh, to do it. Part of it is kind of information. Um, if and a, a lot of it is also linked to potential cognitive or causal mechanisms that might be relating to this, but if it's about people's um, perceptions of meritocracy or fairness that are being kind of um, violated or challenged here, then that's an opportunity for intervention. There's some work, um, some recent work talk uh, that's showing that has an intervention where people, participants are shown two different forms of fairness, micro and macro justice. And that kind of informs people's decisions when they're uh, hiring people. So that might be something that's fruitful for this work um, and scaling up to equality policies. Another thing we really wanna address is this idea of group membership. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there about um, this uh, co common in group model where we, we just blur the lines. That's something that we're not actually trying to do, but more so we're trying to understand if we can form cross-race coalitions. And through this uh, kind of interactions with out group members and uh, these, these intergroup interactions that um, more accurate, more in a way conflicting discussions can result in the, the more accurate solution that equality can actually benefit everyone rather than harm just one group. Okay, I see. So we're probably maybe less invested in this uh, common in group model of like framing it as all Americans or all human beings but instead yeah. respecting that there are these group differences that exist, but just kind of facilitating the understanding across those group boundaries. As exactly, Try, yeah. Trying to find a way to acknowledge the disparity that exists that is on these group lines. We can't avoid that. And it seems like anytime we make those group lines salient, this advantage uh, group membership contingent might seem like they're incurring a loss. We have to find a way to work through that rather than um, completely go around it. Yeah, very interesting. Second, the last question for you is, uh, you know, is there thinking broadly about this effect or this line of research? Is there another future direction that you're really invested in in the years to come? Yeah, it's I'm really, really excited about exploring uh, the idea of coalitions. How do we kind of get people together and uh, kind of tackling an issue um, towards a common goal? Um, in a way, there's some kernels out there again in the negotiations literature that that's that are exciting to to build a front that, to build upon. Um, but I also want to take this back kind of into organizations and looking at looking at how this um, is affecting how diversity initiatives and inclusion initiatives um, can actually be more effective and shaping the ways not only that organizations look in terms of representing people um, throughout all levels of an organization, but also how um, employees, leaders, and corporations can kind of help society engineer a more equal society um, to kind of broaden their reach in a more authentic and kind of genuine way. Okay. Well, I'm definitely not going to argue against that. I, I like what you just said, how it really can kind of complete the circle between your, you saw this real world instances of the way that this effect might be existing out, of, out in the tech industry, but, you know, organizations more broadly do the studies to document it. And then also see how we can be more proactive in working with these organizations to address these types of issues. So exactly yeah, why yeah. people do a pendulum. I'll swing back and forth. <laughs> well, I do social science research, so I'm very interested in seeing that. Uh, the last question I'm going to ask you is, you know, outside of just you know your your own work or this own paper specifically, is there a topic or an issue or problem that you really hope the field of intergroup relations tackles in the years to come? Yeah, I. A couple of things. I think 
and a little bit biased, but I think this, uh, this idea of a zero sum mindset is very pervasive in terms of how people perceive the world. And while this has been studied in the group um, relations for a while, decades, multiple decades, I think there's a lot to continue to explore there and how these beliefs, these cognitive heuristics or representations of how people just believe the world works, strongly held beliefs, it, it, it seems, can interplay, can affect, or even perpetuate or form um, kind of anti-egalitarian ideologies. I think that's a really interesting um, way to go. And then also, I'm really interested about stuff uh, related to egalitarianism, understanding what this concept is, understanding what it means to people who avow and like really believe that they're egalitarian, and then how does that actually relate to what they do to kind of create a society that is one. Okay, yeah, I mean, those are great answers. Uh, I really like this idea of, you know, let's zoom out a little bit. How do people think the world works more generally? What's a fair system? What's the way that the world works? And then how they in turn apply that to where they have to specifically think about intergroup relations. Yeah. How does it shape their attitudes, their beliefs, yeah. their values? Okay, uh, well, that was very interesting. I really thank you for your time, Derek, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, man. It was good to meet you.